Hi everyone. Tonight I'm going to talk about Anne Bradstreet and her works, specifically those collected in The Tenth Muse Lately Sprung Up in America, which was the first book of poetry to be published in what later became the United States. Anne Bradstreet was the wife of Simon Bradstreet and the daughter of Thomas Dudley, who was at one time the governor of Massachusetts Bay. She was educated with access to the Earl of Lincoln's library located at the estate, which her father served as a steward. In all, she was a public servant's wife who raised eight children and wrote poetry. She was dedicated to her life as mother, wife, and poet. Her reaction to the New World was very typical of the Puritan experience. I know that your head note mentions it. Her heart rose at the new world. She didn't know what she was getting into. She didn't know what to expect. And in fact, she experienced the death of more grandchildren than she actually did of her own children. Bradstreet's Tenth Muse was a remarkable collection of poetry. There was, in fact, <clears throat> a first edition in, published in 1650, which featured more conventional poems. She was indebted to Dupartis, a popular French Protestant poet. The title, Tenth Muse, lately sprung up in America, echoes the nickname of the Mexican nun and writer who lived, coincidentally, around the same time, a little later, a little younger, Sir Juana Inez de la Cruz, and you can actually see her work in the uh, earlier pages of the Heath. However, to give you a gloss, doubt and rebellion were not unusual in her time, but modern aesthetics, and in particularly, <coughs> excuse me, the feminist movement, wanted to read her works as showing a split between the dogmatist and the rebel. The rebel. This is a picture of Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, the Mexican nun. And here is an example of her poetry. She's much more outspoken. Now, she was also famous for writing a letter called The Reply to Sor Filiotea, which was basically an impassioned defense for the rights of women to be educated. But let's look at this poem for just a moment. Silly you men, so very adept at wrongly faulting womankind, not seeing you're alone to blame for faults you plant in women's mind. After you've won by urgent plea the right to tarnish her good name, you still expect her to behave, you that coaxed her into shame. Whether you're favored or disdained, nothing can leave you satisfied. You whimper if you're turned away, you sneer if you've been gratified. With you, no woman can hope to score whichever way she's bound to lose. Spurning you, she's ungrateful. Succumbing, you call her lewd. So why are you men all so stunned at the thought you're all guilty alike? Either like them for what you've made them, or make of them what you can like. Well, I won't read the entire thing. I'm sure you can do that on your own. However, I will say this. This, of course, is a, vet, a rather outspoken poem by Sir Juana Inez de la Cruz, and you can see what her tone is. Because my point for bringing up this different writer, this different poet who lived a, around the same time, is simply this, in a different country, is simply this, that tone is important. And tone is the selection of words to create the effect of an attitude, reflecting the author's viewpoints or the character's viewpoints one to another. So let's talk about the prologue, which is one of your readings for today. Now, uh, Jeffrey Hammond, a scholar on Bradstreet and Wigglesworth and Edward Taylor, wrote a book called Sinful Self, Saintly Self, entertaining these three p pilgrims, or excuse me, Puritan poets' work. He called it a didactic exercise in which Bradstreet's authority as a poet is explicitly repudiated but implicitly confirmed. 
In other words, the self-deprecating nature of the prologue and the author to her book is consistent with a didactic purpose. Modesty is better and more useful than pride. Now I'm going to say this. You're going to note, when you read these two pieces, that she's constantly undermining her own work. But she does it in a very clever way. And her irony and her clever references, especially her allusions to educated material that no other woman, or more, well, not many other women would have access to in her age, of course shows her learning. So again, there is that ironic split. But this split says Hammond, is parallel to the bond of humility and assurance that asserts itself time and again in the religious verse. So while we say before God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner, we also can assert with faith God's love for us. So I suppose in a way this is what Hammond's point is, echoing Bradstreet's affirmation of her gifts as well as making, or uh, at least, making a gesture to show humility. Now, I wanted to give you a comparison between Virgil's Aeneid and Bradstreet's prologue, because, of course, it is a direct reference. Virgil's Aeneid, of course, is the story of Aeneas's flight from Troy after the, burning of, uh, the sacking of Troy and the burning of Troy um, by the Greeks. And, of course, this piece, this, this epic, this primary epic, or secondary epic rather, the Virgil's Aeneid, told the story of the founding of Rome. And of course it was written in Latin. And because it was written in Latin and because it was from the Roman period, you can bet that the men educated in England in Anne Bradstreet's time had read that. In fact, they used to read Virgil's Aeneid in order to learn Latin. So this is what Virgil says, and of course you can get it in various translations, more or less. I sing of warfare and a man at war. From the sea coast of Troy in early days he came to Italy by destiny to our Lavinian shore. A fugitive, this captain, a man apart, devoted to his mission. And of course Bradstreet comes along and says, To sing of wars, captains and of kings, of cities founded, commonwealths begun, from my mean pen are two superior things. And, of course, Commonwealth begun as a reference, of course, to the starting of Rome. The author to her book is the supposedly part of a second edition uh, that was supposed to be published in 1666. All right. But then was indeed published posthumously, posthumously in 1678. It features her poems of personal response, such as the in-memory poems that you were supposed to read, or will be reading, if not today, then, then for next time. Now, she uses, in this one poem, the author to her book, she uses an extended metaphor, like Will Taylor, George Herbert, and John Donne. And forgive me, I just noticed my typo on this. And then here we go. It's very appropriate to her experience, of course, being domestic and motherly and maternal. But it's suitably clever, but you notice, or it's suitably humble, but it's terribly clever. Again, that split. So, I wonder if you noticed which extended metaphor is being used. Okay. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth does by my side remain. Till snatched from thence by friends, less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. Made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return my blushing was not small, my rambling brat in print should mother call. All right, I'll just pause there. So what are we comparing? We're comparing her work, her book, to a child. And not just any child, a brat. Full of blemishes, errors, and without a father. And of course, that's significant as well. All right, one other poem that I'm going to have you read in, in your selections is, of course, not exactly the most original in conception, but 
Upon the Burning of Our House, July 10th, 1666, is a poem that, of course, reaffirms the Puritan and Pilgrim experience and their orientation to the afterlife. I just want to read to you a couple of lines, and then I want to share with you something that I have discovered in popular culture. All right, here we go. It begins, of course, with her saying that in silent night when I rest, when rest I took for sorrow near I did not look. Okay, so she's surprised by fire, and this opening isn't too far removed from Wigglesworth's opening. Of course, it's a different tone and a slightly different subject. The flame consumed my dwelling place, and when I could no longer look, I blessed his name that gave and took, that laid my goods now in the dust. Yea, so it was, and so t'was just. And again, she goes on to say, Here stood that trunk, and there that chest, there lay that store I counted best, my pleasant things in ashes lie, and them, behold, no more shall I. Under thy roof no guest shall sit, nor at thy table eat a bit. No pleasant table shall e'er be told, nor things recounted done of old. No candle e'er shall shine in thee, nor bridegroom's voice ever heard shall be. Adieu, adieu, all's vanity. Then straight I gin my heart to chide, and did thy wealth on earth abide? Question mark. Raise up my thoughts above the sky, that dunghill mists away may fly. So again, this this metaphor of dust and loss is significant. The item that I found in popular culture was a song from the band Bastille, and originally I tried to play a portion of it for you in this video and then discovered when I uploaded it to YouTube that of course they had screened it for copyrighted content, even though I only played less than a minute of the song. So to, you know, bypass that particular problem, I will just refer you to that song. I'm sure you can find or hear a sample of it if you're curious. The lyrics run something like this. Again, the song is Bastille's Things We Lost in the Fire, and it goes, Things we lost to the flame, things we'll never see again. All that we've amassed sits before us, shattered into ash. These are the things, the things we lost, the things we lost in the fire, fire, fire. These are the things, the things we lost, the things we lost in the fire, fire, fire. And, of course, it, it's a meditation that continues in the same vein, almost exactly the same vein as Bradstreet. Of course, without the reflection on the justness of God. All right, so I will see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Bye. And if you would like to know more about Anne Bradstreet, I include this bibliography. See you next time. Bye.